And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelt. Welcome to PrennerCast. Yeah, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if we want to. Visit us online at printermedia.tv. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's PrennerCast with me, Dom Goucher, and him, Pete Williams. Hello, hello. Hello. Welcome back. Uh, you've not been totally well the last couple of days, Mr. Uh, Peter. You know, a little bit of a uh, sinusy, nose block, mild flu kind of thing going on. Nothing that's uh, too devastating, but uh, yeah, not feeling 100%. Okay, I do hope you've put something over your microphone just in case you have an accident. <laughs> Right, uh, let's get on with the show. Uh, I, have, I, I just want to say before we do dive in, a little bit of a, a, a geek detour. Um, I've upped my productivity this week with with a single purchase. Ooh, here we go. I've got a second monitor. Ah, nice work. Yeah. Remember that book we talked about a while ago, Pragmatic Thinking and Learning? I do. I think we had a, have a second show still to do. We, we we do we do, but uh, one of the one of the great tips about productivity, overall productivity, in there, uh, and they were quite insistent about this was was getting a second monitor. Now, when I was in, in a previous life working in in design and publishing, um, I, I used to use two monitors, but back in that day, it was thought of as a decadence, um, and I've kind of lasted forever and a day with my with my wonderful big shiny iMac, uh, but it's just got. With all the stuff that we do, all the things that we manage, uh, it became just a bit cramped. So I thought, why not? And I looked into it. And these days, a second monitor, even a decent-sized one, is not expensive. And it's one of those things, once you've done it, you wonder how you ever survived without it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I really do. Even even just another monitor connected to a laptop can make a huge difference. Yeah, oh, I couldn't agree more. It gives you that extra bit of space where if you're you know, doing a lot of copy and pasting or you're, you're working off lists or anything like that, it's great to have that, that source document in one window and then your actual uh, action um, application in the actual window in front of you. It's very, very handy. saves the old alt tab that kind of is a killer for a lot of people. Absolutely. And, and, and by the way, I do not advocate what some people talk about, which is to have all of your emails and Twitters and Skype chats and whatever open on one screen and all your work on the other, because if they're open, they're still distracting you. Yes, so. absolutely. Absolutely. But no, definitely, it's, it's a second monitor is something that uh, a good chunk of our um, our team in the, in the telco office have have dual monitors. Definitely, all our accounts team do, and all our development team do. Not all our sales team, because they don't really need it as much. But all the the people who sort of do the admin, very heavy computer based stuff, definitely have two monitors. Yeah, it's a it is a great productivity boost. I have I've only had it two or three days, and it's just really just changed the way that I work and really speeded up a lot of those operations. So just a tip for everybody. Sounds a bit geeky, but seriously, if, you, if your computer is capable, and most of them are, uh, is capable of running a second monitor, seriously look into it. Um, they're very, very inexpensive nowadays for a good quality monitor, and it will make a huge difference to your productivity. Anyway, that's, that's my geek news, but we have exciting news, don't we, Peter? We do. We uh, released our uh, new project uh, recently. Uh, for those who sort of you know play along at home and, and, and keep a finger on the pulse of the stuff that we do, we try and, oh, for want of a better term, be a bit of an incubator with random ideas and projects and stuff like that. Just when new stuff comes along, we love to sort of play with it and, and, and get it out there and see what's happening. And one of the new um, projects we've got is a, uh, a magazine for Apple's newsstand. Uh, which is called LD Magazine for, for Lifestyle Design. So it's a magazine that we've put together uh, using the MagCast platform, which is a, a brand new platform that allows you to create magazines for the Apple iPad. Um, Apple haven't released a, a platform to allow people to do this yet. They've um, released some high-level documentation for the Clios and the Cosmos and the the news um, world who have sort of big resources and big budgets, but they haven't released a, a platform to allow the, you know everyday person and small publisher to play in the newsstand. But Magcast platform is the is the first, in my opinion, 
easily accessible platform that allows people to, to publish uh, their own magazine. And, and we've been beta and alpha testing that and, and had our first magazine edition come out recently, which had some fantastic content in there from some of the, the leading uh, bloggers and, and, and writers in the lifestyle design and life hacking space. So uh, very, very excited about that. And uh, that's been released to, to great response. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, and the MagCast platform is incredibly easy to use. In fact, it was harder to uh, harder to get the content for the magazine, as it were, than to actually publish the thing. Um, so that was a great thing. I uh, just want to say, I mean, we're, we're, we're testing this as for lots of different reasons. And we will be talking about this both in Preneurcast and in other places soon. Um, because it's a very interesting thing to do. Not only, you know, we, we are, we're interested in the topic, we have a lot of background in the lifestyle design space, both Pete and I, um, but it's a great way of reaching an audience uh, in your niche if you're into that kind of thing. So we'll be, we'll be coming back to LD Magazine. But you can check it out if you have an iPad, and at the moment it is iPad only, um, but if you have an iPad, pop over to ldmagazine.com. And there's a link there to the that newsstand, uh, and you can uh, you can get yourself a copy, which is great. And if you're interested in finding out more about the Magcast platform um, when it goes live and is open to the public, then you can get more information by signing up at magcastplatform.com. I'll put those links in the show notes. But uh, yeah, we're very excited about this. We're uh, just getting edition two ready. And uh, that will be on the newsstand soon, as they say. Absolutely. It's very exciting. So you know, for, for, it's, a lot of people sort of say, well, why would I want to publish a magazine? But, you know, if you're in, you know, the sort of information marketing space, it's, it's pretty obvious. But um, as we saw recently from the Preneur Community Survey results, um, which – was just so overwhelmingly positive. And I love them. If you haven't checked them out, make sure you head over to uh, the blog at preneurmarketing.com. There's a post on there and a video with all the results from the community members and who they are and, and what businesses they have and all that sort of stuff. It was really enlightening because the majority of people who listen to the show and subscribe and follow the blog are traditional business owners. There's, there's most people actually have a business. Um, the vast majority, I think it's close to 60% of the, the community are people who are making a full-time income or more, which is fantastic because so many sort of online communities are just made up of entrepreneurs, for want of a better term, you know, they're chasing the next uh, shiny object and haven't really gotten started or made any money. But it's really cool that the stuff we're talking about on the podcast, on the blog, is obviously helping people make a real difference and actually make full-time income, which is so, so cool. But... Now, if you're in the sort of, you know, the chiropractic space or in, in, you're a tradie, imagine being able to actually publish a magazine about your industry or your broader industry. Maybe you're a roof tile that we keep referring to, and, but you can actually create a magazine about tradies in general and, and helping tradies or just that sort of space. It positions you again as a market leader, which helps you make more sales in the everyday world. Uh, it allows you to actually create connections with other people in your industry that you can then network with and, and leverage off. So there are some really easy uh, ways to use this platform if you're in a traditional business. Um, you can make catalogs and, and put your catalog on the newsstand as an option and things like that too. So there's a lot of great uh, ways you can use newsstand if you are a traditional business owner and not actually an information publisher. Absolutely. Uh, and as I say, we're going to come back and, and maybe do a, a whole show about that. Uh, we're certainly going to be writing about it in, in different places and uh, following up, keep you posted on, on how we get on with that and what we find out. Because uh, as Pete says, we like to be, we like to try these things out. We have the opportunity to uh, get in on the ground floor with some of these technologies. We find out about them and uh, we, we want to make sure that you, the members of the Preneur community, can find out and benefit from them too. That's it. Google has Google Labs. We have Preneur Labs. No? Do 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 we have Preneur Labs? Yeah, that's basically you, dude. Oh, cool. With my two screens. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to buy you a white coat for Christmas. <laughs> Don't make me wear a pocket protector. No, no. We, like, realistically, though, we have a lot of the guys in the Philippines and even you know guys in our office internally here in Australia who do a lot of this sort of testing and playing with these different things as well. So it's very cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so uh, do check out LD Magazine at ldmagazine.com. And uh, as with everything, let us know what you think. Please do. Um, moving on, uh, this week's sponsor, Pete. Um, 
let's let's do a little bit of a, a backtrack. Let's again about practicalities and realities. Um, we talk about Audible, one of our one of our sponsors, and every week we talk about what what we're reading or what we're listening to, more specifically because Audible is the uh, audio book service. Uh, we talk a lot about business books and uh, occasionally the uh, the personal development books, but there's a lot of other things on Audible, isn't there? There is. They've got um, newspapers as well, I think, from memory. They actually should sort of allow you to sort of download audio versions of the news on a daily basis, or at least used to. Um, but they have a whole bunch of fiction books and just general non-fiction stuff as well. Something I'm, I'm really enjoying at the moment, given that the NBA finals are on and watching that on ESPN, is a, a book called These Guys Have All the Fun, which is basically the story of ESPN and, and how it started and how it came to become the, the, the world's leader in um, sports media. So it's, uh, it's really cool. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff on there beyond just non-fiction, business, how-to advice books, which is obviously what we tend to highlight when we talk about Audible. But uh, it's a fantastic service. And you know, if you want to just try it out, you can get the free trial, which is at um, audibletrial.com forward slash preneurcast, where you can just sign up and, and get one audiobook and give it a crack. You don't have to actually go and invest any money and subscribe for the long haul you can just uh sign up take it for a test drive download a book of of whatever tickles your fancy you could go and download the hunger games if you really wanted to and listen to that in audio format and um check out the service because if you're you know doing any sort of um personal training or you're driving to work or you know however you can tune this podcast unfortunately we don't have you know 20 hours of content a week for you to listen to on your commute to work and stuff like that so uh, audible is a great way to consume um, books and other great content uh, in the same way you listen to the podcast. So I highly recommend their service. Cool. Excellent. So it's just another way of looking at the, the different resources that are out there. All right, Pete, I want to get into this because you, you set me off the other week. We, you, in an offhand manner, you mentioned leakage and said that we'd come back to that. And uh, ever since you mentioned that, it's, been, it's really been preying on my mind because leakage is like the elephant in the room, isn't it, really? Absolutely. I think you've made a whole bunch of notes about this, haven't you? I'm very excited to hear this because you've uh, done some homework for this week's show. <laughs> but, well, it, it, it's just a huge topic. I always do my homework. Don't be like that. <laughs> like the, the dog eats it occasionally, but I do it. Um, leakage, let, let, let's, let's, let's uh, give a context. Let's set a frame for leakage. Leakage is is anywhere in your business where you are letting things slip away. So really, I mean, at the top level, in very, very simple terms, leakage, if you can stop it, is like free money. Because if, if you look at your business anywhere where you're not being efficient, where you're not efficiently doing things, like efficiently getting traffic or efficiently converting op opt-ins or conversions and things like that going back you know using the, the seven levers as a, as a guide here um you're you're taking away potential revenue and potential profit from your business yeah i, I think uh, like the, the way i i, I kind of look at leverage is, is very very similar in that you know most business, or even leakage or even leakage sorry <laughs> um it's, it's the cold. No, the leverage flu. shows another show. It's the cold. It's the flu. It's the the, the haze. But um, when it comes to leakage, and I guess attracting new revenue for a business, most people are looking for that shiny object that I kind of mentioned before when I was talking about the entrepreneurs, um, and they just always sort of jump from one thing to the next and never really maximize what they've already got. And it's that also it's that maximization of what they're already doing. Which is another way to look at leakage because you know yes. if you've got you know a certain marketing campaign being run and you're not split testing at least a portion of that on a continual basis, there could actually be a better way to do that particular piece of marketing. Maybe it's you're running an AdWords campaign and in your ad group you've got just one ad running. Well, why not do an AAB split test where you have three ads running in that ad group where two of the ads are identical. And then one of the ads is unique. It's a split test. So that way you're only risking 33% of those impressions on the test. You, by having two ads run simultaneously identical, they take up obviously 66% of all the impressions and 33% goes to this test. So it's a way just to maximize that marketing channel. 
because you could be getting some leakage with lost revenue. It's not having to actually learn AdWords again or learn a brand new marketing uh, or traffic strategy. It's just getting more out of what you've already got. Absolutely. And, and for anybody that glazed over when he got to AAB split test, the, 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 the message there is absolutely getting the most out of what you've already got rather than chasing something new. It's like anything, anything that you do, uh, most people I think in business have heard the, the adage that it's, it's cheaper to keep a customer than to get a new one. It takes less effort to keep a customer than to, to, to get a new one. And so leakage is our way of, of saying that there's very often an opportunity to improve your processes and improve areas of your business without doing something actually new, without going to find a new source of traffic, without, as, as Pete says, starting a new campaign or, or, or whatever, yeah? Well, well, to take that saying you spoke about and you know, preneurify it, if you will, um, I'm, going, I'm going to get this into the language and vocabulary of everyone I know, but um, it's, it's easier to convert a, uh, an existing prospect than finding a new one. In a hierarchy. That's it. So that, that's what it's all about is really tweaking and, and fine-tuning what you're already doing right now because I think we've mentioned this a couple of times on the show, especially when we talk about the seven levers, is that you know for a lot of people, just by measuring what they're already doing, they actually will, will just suddenly see where the leakage is because, as you said, it's the elephant in the room and quite often when you start measuring something, you'll clearly see that there's actually a hole in what you're doing right now and you can plug that very, very quickly and often get five or six or even you know ten or fifteen percent increases in that lever because of just identifying that hole and fixing the leak absolutely and, and this is actually what i wanted to say as, as the starting point to this discussion is that we have to before we do anything we have to measure and once we're measuring we have to monitor you know this is the 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 main the main guiding guidance that we give to anybody following the seven levers as a framework it is it's not just about tweaking pushing adding moving changing but you start by measuring and you're absolutely right pete i mean in the mastermind group that we've done and the feedback that we've got about the seven levers you know that the, the biggest thing we've got back is that people have got improvements just by going through the process of measuring and noting down where each one of those things is um and and that's that's a really important thing when you're handling any part of your business. You've got to, as Peter Drucker says, you can't manage what you don't measure. Very true. Very true. So so we, we we've danced around this a bit, and I think the best way to to give some examples of where you can have leakage and uh, how you can plug a leak, as it were, um, is actually using the seven levers framework. Let's go. Let's get the scotch tape out. And uh, fix some of this leak. Doesn't scotch tape fix everything? Is that right? I think it's, it's duct tape. Duct tape. Isn't that the same thing? What's, what's the difference? I'm so not manly. Uh, yeah, in, in England, scotch tape is tape. That's the transparent stuff. Ah, there you go too. Yep, duct tape. And you're right. right. That, let's get the duct tape, that, tape out. Yeah, let's get the duct tape mm. out. Okay, or just one big cork. Or even <laughs> stick your finger in it. Okay, uh, so starting with traffic. How could you be leaking traffic? Um, well, obviously, it depends, as we talk about with seven levers, it depends what traffic means to you. Is traffic foot traffic? Is it people coming through the door of your store? Is it people visiting your website um, after searching for you? Is it people clicking on your Google ad? What What is it? You know, But whatever it is, um, I, I've, I've come across some, from our experience, I've come across some examples of how you can leak traffic. Um, and, and it's amazing how many people don't think about this and don't think about these things. And basically, one of the ways you can leak traffic is by not putting out signs. Well, one of our examples from the mentoring group for, for Seven Levers was, um, from the mastermind group, was somebody put an A-frame sign out in the street or out in front of their shop. And because it was sticking out, people could see it as they walked along instead of having to turn to, to look at the front of the shop. So they were made aware that the shop was there. And that increased that increased traffic into the shop immediately. Yeah? Yep, absolutely. Because the traffic was already walking past the shop. It just put a bit of a, uh, a signpost 
if you will, in front of them. Yeah, and a, another kind of signpost and another example from one of my clients is making sure people know what you do. So uh, I have a, one of my clients is um, is, a, is an instructor and they they have a lot of courses that they teach and they told me a story about people coming to their to their training center and taking the, the basic courses uh, and then at a certain point they stop taking courses they'll come uh, and use the facilities of the, the center to to kind of partake as it were but they won't come for that actual course they'll come back and say hey i just did this great course and uh, my client was talking to me and said but why does this keep happening i said well why don't you ask somebody and and they said and, and the first person he asked he said oh do you teach that subject so I had the, 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 the basic introductory sort of courses covered, and then when people would go to do the intermediate or advanced stuff, they'd hire the gear and use the facility, but get someone else yep. to actually do the training. That's exactly it, because they were completely unaware that that training centre was capable of teaching that course. They just hadn't told people their entire range of capabilities. So that's where the, the newsletter comes in, the touch yep. marketing, the back-end yep. sort of upsell sort of stuff that we keep talking about, um, particularly yep. when we talk about the seven levers. Absolutely, and, and also the printer hierarchy about keeping an existing client. If you've got an existing client, if you're educating that existing client to what you can do, and as they move through, you know, the example you've, you've given before, Pete, about the cycle shop, you know, you had the first time somebody comes into your shop and they buy a basic bike, then keeping them informed, keeping, you know, keeping in touch with them, letting them know how they can service their bike, uh, options for upgrading their bike, extra clothing, extra, uh, extra things like that, Th then you're, you're, gener you're generating new traffic, new sales back to your business by just by educating your customer. Otherwise, they may cycle around and they may see another cycle shop with a big sign in the window saying cycle servicing. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. So... It, very, very simple, very almost trivial traffic leakage can happen by people not even seeing your business, you know, and that, that can be as like, do you, do you even advertise? If it's relevant to you, do you even advertise? Um, but also not seeing it is your signage up to scratch. Uh, Pete, Pete, we've talked about it before, an example of the, uh, the, the garish luminous signs in the window yep. with your offers on. Absolutely. And that number of clients I deal with in that retail space, the first thing I tell them to do is get the sign writer in with the fluoro yellow on the window. It absolutely works. It, it stands out. It might not be you know, aesthetically pleasing for the wife to talk about a bridge club on a Friday afternoon, but it'll actually get people in the door, which will you know, allow you to buy the wife the big diamond bracelet, which will distract her from the ugly sign. So, you know, what's the outcome you want? <laughs> Um, so look, I, I look at traffic a little, a little bit differently to what you're looking at and, and when it comes to leakage anyway and go back to that sort of example I spoke about before is what are you already proactively doing that you can, you can tweak? Because I'd say what you described is absolutely 100% true when it comes to leakage about traffic, but there are almost ways just to very easily get additional um, eyeballs to your business. Whereas if you're already doing you know, Google AdWords, for example, uh, or you're already doing Google local, you've already got a, a local page in Google Maps, well, are you really maximizing that? Have you put coupons on it? Have you got all the images you can possibly have on your Google local account? Have you got video embedded into your Google local page? All that sort of stuff, to me, is a form of leakage because you're already doing the AdWords campaign, but probably, probably without the AAB split test. Or you've already got that Google local page, but you haven't maximized it. So that's the sort of stuff I consider and work with a client when I first think about leakage. It's like, okay, let's list out everything you're currently doing right now to generate traffic, if that's the level we're working on. And actually go through each one of the actual tools or mechanics or tactics they're doing when it comes to traffic and almost creating a checklist against that and saying, okay, are you maximizing everything you can with that particular tactic? Before we do anything new, it's let's actually assess that particular tactic and see where the leakage absolutely. is. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's it, is, is we can look at the leakage from, from both perspectives. Absolutely. We, we can look at literally, are you, are you doing anything or are you doing the, the main things that you should be doing that are easy, that are easy wins? 
but also whatever you are doing, are you doing it? Are you maximizing it before you pick something else? And I think traffic is one of the things we've spent a little bit of time in traffic uh, and we're focusing on it a lot, but I think traffic is one of the things that people do get hung up on and they will go and go off after the next big oh, shiny thing. Absolutely. Yeah? So it's important to, I think we're going to kind of just over make this point because I think so many people get caught up in, in ch just shiny chasing. Be that, there's my word for the week. It's not as good as yours, but they, they get caught up in it. Instead of looking at what they're doing and maximizing the effect of that, they, they just drop it. If it doesn't seem to work for them, they just drop it and go to the next one. And that is very, very hard work, very inefficient. There's a lot of leakage just in that activity alone. Absolutely, absolutely. When you look at ROI, what it takes to learn, implement, and get relatively right a brand new tactic versus just tweaking and molding and maximizing a current technique, the ROI on the latter is so much more powerful. Absolutely. I mean, it's just a, a classic example, just to get a little bit geeky for a second, the current screaming and kicking that's going on with, with Google having changed its its policies for, for different things. Um, and so many, if, let's say for the last two or three years, you have two people. Uh, one person sat down and focused on the the one thing they were going to do. They were focused on their Google AdWords. And for three years, they've ignored all this, you can get traffic by going here. People will beat your door down if you go, all that. They ignored it all. And they just focused on their AdWords. They did their split testing. They f really optimized their website. They optimized their landing pages. And we'll come back to that in a second. But they really focused on attracting the right people into the top of their funnel, getting the right kinds of traffic, using that one primary traffic method we're talking about search engines now it's not the only traffic method but focusing on search engines and then there's the other guy who tried adwords for about a day or maybe even a week got went went all out and tried it for a week and just you know really slogged through it and got himself set up and didn't get a great result so he dropped that and then he's since then tried facebook ads and he's tried um different different advertising campaigns he's also tried grabbing traffic from video he's tried everything um, and nothing seems to have really worked um, and he's expended all that energy whereas the guy the guy with the adwords i would imagine has now got a very consistent source of traffic um, and anybody having flitted around and not been consistent has probably suffered quite a lot from these recent changes Yep. So absolutely, you know, much less effort, much more result, better return on investment, and that's what we're about here. We're about on return on investment. What other sort of leakage notes have you put together, dear Dom? Well, let's let's move on. Let's move on because, as I say, we just focused on traffic because it's a big. That is a big one, and the, the seven levers is. It's not about any one thing. It's about that compound effect. It's about making a small change and rolling it up to the next level and the next, le next lever and the next lever and the next lever. So the compound effect is massive. So people get hung up on traffic, and really you don't need to, to change any of the levers that much as we, we talk about regularly. So let, let's move away from traffic. Let's move to opt-ins. And opt-ins is anybody, anybody taking an action in in your space and again opt-ins might mean one thing to one person and one thing to another it might mean somebody trying on a shoe in a shoe store it may be somebody filling out your email subscription box on your website um but the the thing that i've got and again i'm com i'm going coming in from a simplistic angle and i'm sure pete you've got some more technical stuff but for me the big thing and it's always the same whatever an opt-in is whatever your goal is don't make it hard and classic examples of this are, say, take, take two online examples, which are, first of all, um, somebody wants a, an online response, so they want you, they want you to fill out uh, a form to, to enter into their email list on their website. A classic example of making it hard is hiding the email subscription box, putting it down the bottom right-hand corner of the page, or just making it making it not not easy to see because it's not highlighted that kind of thing or even making it not clear that that's what you want them to do that's an example of making it hard but the other one I'm my personal favorite which is pretty much I, I get a something like a 75 to 80 percent hit rate on this with anybody with an online presence when I say what's your primary goal and they say we want people to phone us 
And what's my response to that usually, Pete? Where is that phone number you want them to call? Exactly. That's the classic example of making it hard for people to opt in. If you want somebody to phone you and you've got a website, make sure the phone number's really big and at the top of the screen. And say, for a suggestion next to it, phone us. Possibly even say why. Like phone us for a quote. Um, so, that, I mean, they're my, again, really simple, big wins, very simple to do. You've already got whatever it is you're already doing, whether you're placing an advert in print, whether you're building a website, whatever it is, what is your primary goal? Make sure it's easy for people to actually get that done. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I'd take that to a slightly deeper um, level and sort of say, you know, split testing again. This is, you know, anywhere mm-hmm. it comes to the actual traffic uh, opt-ins conversion scenario with a lot of things, particularly if you're a web-based business, whether you're an information marketer selling e-books or you're a dentist trying to get people to call up and make appointments or whether you're a, uh, a removalist trying to get people to fill in a, a form to receive a quote for your removalist services, you know, using split testing tools. You know, Google um, has a, a free split testing service. Uh, there's also Zentester, which is a great service that allows you to sort of do split tests very, very easy on your website. So you can test headlines, test opt-in boxes, even test videos. When we did the relaunch of the, the MCG project uh, about 12, 18 months ago now, it probably would have been, we actually uh, completely split test the the first page of the um, the marketing funnel where there was three videos, three headlines and three different calls to actions right above the opt-in box. So the page layout didn't change, just the actual copy on the page changed and it was remarkable how different the results were. I think it, you know, one of the combinations was, let's say, I can't remember the exact stats, but something like 6% conversion rate, whereas another combination got up to like 13 or 14% conversion rate. So if I just had a gut feel and went with, you know, combination A, I would have got a 6% conversion rate, which is not too bad realistically for cold traffic. But by split testing, I found out very, very quickly that a different combination actually got me twice as many opt-ins, which means my cost of acquisition for new clients was halved, or cost of acquisition at least for prospects was halved. So I got twice the amount of people on my list for the same cost in traffic generation. So that's the leakage I clearly see in so many businesses by not split testing their website or their marketing pieces. If you're doing cold calling to generate business for yourself, split testing the scripts that the cold call center uses, maybe using direct marketing. Again, doing split tests is just a huge, huge leverage, re- sorry, leverage. It's a leakage reducer. It is a plug that is so vital to do for, for opt-ins and conversions because that, that's like where the leakage is, in my opinion. I completely agree. Uh, do you know what? I think do you know, split testing as a principle um, applies across. I mean, a lot of people think that it's just an online thing. And some people may not even know what we're talking about. So what I think we should do is I think we should do a show on split testing. Let's get Brent Hodgson on the line for that one. He is one of the best copywriters. He is uh, a man behind one of the best split testing software platforms. And he has split test websites, sales letters, copy, a whole bunch of stuff. That's absolutely the person that I had in mind as well. Brent, <laughs> you're on notice. You're on the show. Okay, let's, let's, let's move on. But absolutely, split testing I think is pretty much one of those standard things now that we can say – split test it and it has amazing effect against leakage so absolutely i think i do think it's so important we should we should get brent on uh and talk from from scratch about split testing it's that important okay let's look let's look at the next level which is conversion um and one of the things i think uh in opt-ins i said make it don't don't make it hard for people to opt in a lot of people don't notice but they actually make it hard for people to convert they make it hard for people to buy they don't think they are but very often they do and and again simple big hits are things like uh hiding the buy button seriously um hiding hiding the shopping cart on an online service hiding the tills in a shop i honestly sometimes i've been in shops and and i can't find a till i cannot actually literally give people my money can't do it. Take take the flip of that, the complete opposite, um, the the ultimate streamlining of purchases. Walk into an Apple store. 
it you used know, to be through the crowds you... first. <laughs> ah, it depends where you go. Depends where you go. Um, but and what time as well? Uh, you usually just have to wade through the the students using the the, the machines to check their email. Um, but you walk into an Apple store, and even from day one, you could walk into an Apple store, and somebody could actually take your order where you stood. They had portable point of sale devices, uh, and they could take your order from where you stood. Now it's got to the point where if you have an Apple device in certain stores, you can actually scan the barcode and pay online with your own Apple device. You literally just pick a box up, scan it, press a button and pay through your Apple account, and that's it, all done. That is very, very <laughs> it's cra- cool. It's, it's crazy, but it's, it's a reduction of friction. But you don't have to go to that extent at all. It can be the simple things. And one of the things that is that that really I think is a source of a massive amount of leakage, depending on your business, is actually asking for the sale. Yep. People don't ask for the sale sometimes. They don't ask make you know, ask people to buy things. They just don't do it. Um and and that that's for me is a big one. But but the other one is being unclear and I see this a lot online. It's not so much not so much in retail bricks and mortar, but I see it a lot online, is being unclear about what people are buying. People want if the more people spend, the more they want to know what they're getting. To a point, and then after that, honestly, sometimes I, I'm, I'm amazed what people will spend without knowing what they're getting. But there's this this middle ground where people it's like I do it all the time. I'll go and I'll look at an offer, I'll look at a product, I'll look at something, and it might be a piece of electronics. I'm looking for the specifications. Uh, it might be an information product, and I'm looking for the contents or the method of delivery or whatever. But th- there's a massive amount of friction there when it's not clear uh, what what you're being offered. So that, to me, again, either asking for the sale or at least making it easy for people to buy things, but also informing them, I think, uh, are ways of getting over that leakage, getting over people walking away from your, your walking away from a purchase. Yeah, yeah? absolutely. I think, I think you hit the nail on the head where you said it before, just reducing that friction and asking mm. for the sale. They're the two keys to sort of stopping conversion leakage. Yeah, I mean, I, and this is the thing. we talk When we talk about the seven levers, I mean, I could go, there's another side to this, which is how to improve conversion. But we're not even talking about improving conversion. In my mind, if you're addressing leakage, you're actually getting yourself to a baseline. Yeah, if you're, absolutely. If you're, currently, if you're currently preventing people from buying, from buying from you, then, then that's a, to me, that's a different thing to, to actually improving you know, you should at least get to a baseline. You know, don't don't hide the tills. Don't 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 make it difficult for people to buy from you. Yeah, I think that's a very important point you hit on. I think sorry to interrupt you, but it's a very very no, important no. point and very clear way of, of getting clarity. Funnily enough, in that yeah, like so many people, they they are. And we're sort of repeating ourselves here, but I think it's really important to drive it home that so many people want to start the new thing or do the new thing because it's exciting and that's just human nature but you know the the leakage is just allowing your boat to float before you try and sail off to the new journey um, and making that that new journey easier because you've got that non-leaky boat underneath that's sort of you know something that's really important to do in fact something that came up this week um, and and I, I had to pull out one of my stock phrases um, somebody asked me to uh, to look at a website for them, to review a website. And we do this. We've done this for the mastermind group before. Um, depending, we, we want to know what the goal is, and, and then we'll, we'll review a site or a piece of marketing material or whatever against the seven levers. And uh, I looked at this website, and I sent them back a basically a one-line response. I said, this is a brick wall website. And brick wall website is basically, it, it, the way to imagine it is, is it, the the site is basically so difficult to use that you're getting in the way of the goal. You're getting in the way of, of an opt-in. You're getting in the way of conversion. And it, the reason why I call it a brick wall is because I want people to understand, would you seriously have a brick wall 
built in front of your retail high street shop and then ask people to visit your shop? No. Good analogy. Very, very good yeah. analogy. But so many people have these websites that you couldn't convert if you clicked the button for the visitor. And yet they're paying money for pay-per-click traffic, they're doing extensive search engine optimization, they're running print ads, they're doing direct mail, they're doing whatever, yeah? But but <laughs> there's this, there, it's not even leakage. I, I'm going to get extreme. It's hemorrhaging. They're hemorrhaging. Well, if let, they've got a brick wall website. Let me give you another, another uh, story from a, 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 a consulting client I was working with once. That, uh, And the analogy I gave to him at the end of it is you are your competition. And the reason I, I gave that to him is because he was laughing about how inept his competitors are and how, how they do silly things and how he doesn't do that sort of stuff and yada, 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 like everyone does. And we were looking through their AdWords campaign uh, and doing a bit of a, a review on that and a bit of a leakage assessment and things like that. And we we found that there was a number of actual adverts that he's paying for that is getting significant traffic that he's sending traffic to a 404 error page. Ooh. He changed his website but didn't go and change the corresponding uh, AdWords campaign. Now, A, changing your website and not putting a 301 redirect in there for SEO reasons is a no-no, and that's probably uh, technical enough for the show. If someone you know, is doing that sort of stuff... You want to go and Google that phrase, it's important. But then also, he was running AdWords to those pages. And it was just, he was literally just pouring money down the drain. That is a perfect example of leakage. He was spending money to drive traffic to a 404 error page, and people were just bouncing and leaving the site for obvious reasons. So, and you know, what, was the, what, what was the actual reason that happened? Not the technical reason, but what was he not doing? Measuring. What that allowed that to happen? He wasn't measuring and monitoring. Exactly right. So, so I guess this is a big, big wake-up call for everyone. Is you are your competition. If you th- if you have been to AdWords and everyone's done this at least once, clicked on an AdWords ad and it's gone to a page with a broken um, 404 error page or uh, just a, the page doesn't exist or something like that. Everyone has done it at least once. Probably once in the last couple of months they've clicked on a link in AdWords, and you laugh going, "How inept is my competition?" Well, I would guarantee that. A least a handful, if not a hundred, if not a thousand listeners this week, if they go and check their AdWords campaign, will be doing something silly like this. Uh, it's inevitable if you're not monitoring and measuring this stuff. So if you're running AdWords campaign, please do me a favor. If you do anything after this this show, this is your homework for this week's episode, is to go and just check your AdWords campaign, all the landing pages from your ads to make sure they actually are going to a relevant page. Make sure that is a page that works, and if you've got a bit of time, make sure the message to market match is live, that you're sending them to the right page of your website. Very good. Very good. And a corollary to that, as as you are your competition, and this is equally important from the, the brick wall, not asking for it, making it easy, friction point of view, and one that I tell people is, you are not your client. And this comes from the years I spent building websites for people and doing usability. Because so many businesses, when they go to have a website built, and I say that rather than just saying go to a web designer, but however they get it done. And what happens is that you end up, and this was the reason why this brick wall website came in front of me, because the business owner took responsibility for designing the site. And the I can, I can hear I can hear the little voice that always comes back. It's the same response. But yes, but I want them to know what I do. I want them to know all my services. Yeah, you want them to do that. What do they want? They're the customer. They want something from your business, whether it's to easily find out what you do, but maybe it's to easily find out your phone number. Sometimes a website is just for that reason. It's just a brochure page to do that. But whatever it is, you need to you need to stop thinking what you want your customers to do and, and, and overloading them with choices because you're trying to show them everything and, and just realize either what is your one goal, what is, what is it you, you know, what one thing do you want them to do to focus them and then you'll get the, the customers that, you, that want to do that or you want to find out what your customers want to do. And one of the ways, and we'll come back to this in the show, is through split testing. Because whatever you think is the coolest headline or the best call to action or the right picture or the right video to go with that 
sales page or whatever it might be, you don't know. But if you're willing to run a test and measure and monitor, your customers will actually tell you. Yep. Absolutely. C cool. All right. This show, we're, we, are, we are really pushing for time here. Um, so because I've got the, the rest of the seven levers, um, I, can, I can wrap up with, in, my, in my mind with pretty much the same examples. So I'm going to jump three of the next levers just to, just to get us some time back in the show. Um, and that is that the number of items, um, the average item value, and the transact number of transactions per customer have very similar leakage points to me. The number of items that somebody buys, uh, and this is the most common example that we ever give in a retail space, you can affect the number of items that somebody buys by simply offering them another item when they're buying something. Would you like fries with that? For example, or putting a, a, a display of complimentary products at the checkout, things like that, or on an online service, offering another product during the checkout process. Uh, Amazon are absolutely famous for this. Other people bought this. Go Every daddy. Put something in the basket. <laughs> okay, yeah. Go daddy, take it to the extreme. They really do. If you want to see how to overdo that and annoy people, go to GoDaddy. But this, great, is, this great is my service. argument, though. This, this, this is my argument for a lot of people. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. GoDaddy is a multi-million dollar company. Yeah, so, they got there somehow. So many people <laughs> still use GoDaddy as their primary domain registrar. So it cannot yep. be that annoying. Oh no, absolutely. I mean, it, and that's another that's a topic for another discussion. That is, I mean, we think it's annoying. I think it's annoying. You think it's annoying. But I'm sure that somebody who goes there for the first time thinks it's very helpful to have all these extra services suggested that they may not have thought of. Absolutely. So, and I'm sure they split tested that process. No doubt. Absolutely no doubt. Um, so, absolutely, no, just simply not asking for or offering those extra those extra items will be a way of leaking potential extra items per sale. Um, similarly, um, increasing the average item value or just just not selling not selling items of a high value, leaking the potential. Um, again, if you don't offer items of a higher value, you can't sell items of a higher value. Or if you offer a discount before the customer even opens their mouth. Oh, oh, that was, you know, that's one of my favourite things you've ever said. One of my favourite things you've ever said, if ever I'm ever talking to a client, I have your voice in the back of my head that says, don't offer a discount before they ask. The, the, the couple of retail stores I was working with, I was uh, just in there actually uh, just randomly um, not doing any spying or anything like that, but I was just in the store doing some transactions for my own purposes and overheard some of the sales clerks doing some, um, some leakage. They were doing some leakage. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just it's infuriating so you know it's the first thing it's like get on the phone to the, to the business owner and say got to get back to training got to get back to sales training got to train these guys got to give them more assets give them more tools give them more weapons in their arsenal so they can actually have other things to communicate and discuss and use to close the sale other than here's a discount and that's all about training that's what it comes down to is training your staff and giving them other uh, tools to use because if all they know is discounting, like if they don't know how to, you know, pre-frame a conversation, if they don't know how to future pace a conversation, if they don't know how to um, do guided discovery, all these different, you know, communications and sales techniques, what do you expect? How are they going to learn that sort of stuff? They're only going to learn that if you teach them that. You know, if, if you leave them to their own devices, all they're going to do is discount because as a client and as a consumer, which is where they are for the majority of their life, is after discounts, and that's how they purchase. So you need to educate them. You need to train them to stop the leakage. That is Absolutely. that is your scotch tape, if you will. It, it, that training is a big scotch tape, a very, very powerful scotch tape, duct tape. Duct tape, duct tape. It's, it's, it's something sticky that will hold things together. Get on with it's, it. It's your chewing gum. <laughs> Anything, just stop the leakage. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And... Uh, I, I do think, I mean, that's a, that's a big thing, and I, I'm serious about that. I'm absolutely serious. The reflex to discount is one of the biggest sources of leakage uh, across the board in businesses that I've come across as well. Um, 
And and again, just transactions, the number of transactions that you that a customer will have with you in any given year. How do you know that you're doing everything to get as many transactions as you can? Did you did you ask for any more transactions? Did you communicate with your customers and suggest that they might want to come back and buy something else from you? Whether it's an add-on service, uh, a checkup, an extra piece of equipment, whatever. Um, just so many businesses, by not communicating with their existing customer base, are, again, leaking. Leaking very easy, very high return on investment potential for revenue and profit. Yeah? Absolutely. That's, it, you just got to measure and monitor it. That's all it comes down to. So the, the last of the seven levers, and I think this might get a little bit bigger than, than, than some offhand big wins, is margins. Um, and I think, again, margin, and that is being clear, it's not the markup you put on your products. It's what, what percentage of your sales can be classed as profit, which is a slightly different thing, and it's important to distinguish that because that means that your whole business contributes to the margins, not just the markup you put on the product. So... And this is why I think margins is, again, one of the huge sources of leakage. Um, because basically every every part of your business, every aspect of your business has an opportunity to affect the margins. The From from what you pay for the services that your business uses, whether it's your telephone and internet connection, uh, to what you actually pay for the raw materials for the product, um, or what you pay for your advertising, or how efficient your staff are or how efficient you are as the business owner with your time, all those things affect margins, right? Absolutely, yeah. That's exactly what the numbers come up to be. Yeah. And and so there's huge opportunity. And again, just measuring. For example, I, I, but this is a really easy one, and I'm, I'm sure everybody has done this or or can certainly do it, is how much are you paying for that mobile phone contract right now? Just go measure that. Go have a look. Is it efficient? <laughs> really? You know, how much are you paying for these services that now there are a lot, there's a lot of competition in the world for utilities, for, for mobile phones, for communications, for internet? You know, do you need all those phone lines if you've got more than one? Do you, are you using them? Are you, do you still need the fax line? Yeah. All these things. Are you just paying for them because you paid for them five years ago and you've been paying for them for five years? Yeah, well, a, a perfect example for a fax line is rather than having a traditional fax line is, you know, two things we tell a lot of clients in the telco world if, to bring that up right now to give some people some actionable things around that as well is you can actually have your fax, your FPOS line and your ADSL phone line all being the same phone line. And so many people I see are paying 30 bucks a month line rental for three separate lines as opposed to pulling them all into one line. That saves you 60 bucks a month right there. You know, eFax yeah. is a great solution. It's eFax.com.au. It's a fantastic solution and alternative for having a traditional fax line. It actually gives you a real-world phone number. Uh, I think Grasshopper is the US version of this, and it lets you have a real-world phone number that you know you can give out, and that's your fax number. When people e fax that phone number, it gets converted to a PDF and emailed to one or multiple recipients. Very, very easy to do. Um, and, and this and is, that's, this is oh. where we're sort of saying, sorry, just to sort of, when you talk about doing your, you know, your seven levers ritual where every seven weeks you work through each one of these levers, you should be sitting down every seventh week to look at the margins of your business. Pull out your P&L and um, go through where all your expenses are. Go through line by line on your P&L and work out how can I reduce this particular expense. And then call some people, negotiate some stuff, look for some alternatives and actually work through that. Because so many people don't think about reducing their expenses that often. And this is where the seven levers habit comes in, is that every seven weeks you're reassessing your costs. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and the, my only thing I was going to add to that is, is that as well as actually kind of negotiating with service providers, or and, and that's one of those things that some people might not be comfortable doing, Try and look for a technology solution. You know, your example of eFax or Grasshopper, these, these services that now exist that two, two, three years ago didn't exist. 
you know, I, things change and things are changing at a rapid pace. And there are a lot of solutions out there now for things that we couldn't have imagined five years ago or that we wish there might have been but couldn't see it or couldn't find it. And they're out there and they're very cost effective. Um, and, and there's a lot of incredible opportunities out there to improve your margins and to improve the efficiency of your business. Um, and so that's that. But the other, I just want to just lean people the other way just a little bit, which is the efficiency of you and your staff. Um, if, you're a, if you're a solopreneur, if it's just you, and this, this brings us really full circle to wrap this up. Um, Pete and I do a lot of things just on our own. Pete's got businesses uh, that he has employ staff, and I've got my businesses and, and I employ staff, but some things I do on my own. There are some things that really, at the end of the day, there is only you can do it. And whether you're a solopreneur or whether you're the person at the, the, the head of the business or wherever you are in, in the business, your efficiency is a factor in that business and the margins and, and of that business. And so, for example, I spent $200 this week, bought myself a new screen. I probably made that $200 back in efficiency within five hours of opening the box. So in terms of efficiency, in terms of profitability of my business, in terms of the effectiveness of my business, whether it's in actual physical dollars in the bank or whether it's just in spare time that i now have because i'm not working working double the effort i need to i've i've looked at my own personal efficiency and i and pete and i always look at the efficiency of our staff as well and and in in ways that we can improve that through training or communication or tools um as a way of addressing margins in our business so it's not all about the the, the flat money and what you're giving out in money sometimes it's it's slightly less tangible but it's just as important love it love it all right i think at, at, at extremely over time uh that's a great wrap up i just as i said as you can tell i that's been on my mind since you mentioned it leakage has been on my mind um and i think that was a, a great coverage there we just we did dash through a little bit due to time but hopefully people have got uh got an idea about what we're talking about and some ideas about where you can go uh, and look for leakage in your business. But the big thing is the message we had at the start, and we're going we're gonna to close with this message, is it's about measuring and monitoring. It's not about guessing. If you measure, then you know. You know what you're paying. You know how many, of, how many percentage you're getting on conversion or opt-in or whatever. You've got to measure it and monitor it. Otherwise, you can't manage it. Sounds good. Cool. So next week, I've got I've got a topic for next week. Oh, I want to see this right now. And yes, that was actually a pun, which you'll understand in a minute. Oh dear. The, the topic I want to talk about next week is low lying marketing and productivity fruit. Ah, low hanging fruit. Or low lying, same thing. <laughs> low hanging or low yeah, lying enough. fruit. I like that. I like it as a topic. I like it. Easy, easy win. So this is not this is not stuff that's this, this, yeah the easy wins, and this is not stuff that you know. You have to do like we spoke about this on a previous episode recently, where people sort of say this is the stuff every business must do. Now, I think the stuff we're going to cover in that episode will be applicable to most listeners, but again, get the context right and see how they apply to your business. There's going to be a whole bunch of stuff: marketing techniques, productivity techniques, efficiency, business management stuff. Just a whole bunch of low lying, preneur marketing. I'm going to use I'm going to use low lying, low low hanging, preneur marketing fruit. Cool. I like that. I'm looking forward to that one. But folks, just to uh, just to remind you, if you want a uh, if you want a lot, if you want help staying on track with the seven levers habit, if you want more ideas, more in depth uh, strategies and tactics, and even real examples of of what you can do to to either plug the leakage or improve the seven levers in your business, we are putting together a seven levers home study course pete and i are putting the finishing touches to this there's a really really good reason why it's not there yet folks and you're gonna love the reason we decided to plus this beyond beyond what we originally envisaged for the product so we're just getting it right but pop over to sevenlevers.com put your name 
an email in that box that's there and we'll let you know as soon as the home study course is available yeah. and when it is we think you're really really going to like what we've done I'm going to actually give you a bit of a hint is that you know it's more than just a home study course there's actually going to be a whole lot of interaction uh, on an ongoing basis and support with this so consider um, the seven levers course uh, a very structured way to, to grow your business and apply the seven levers to it but along with that there's going to be for want of a better word a advisory board community aspect to this on an ongoing basis where we can uh, uh, support you and your business from um, arm's length as almost your advisory board which I'm uh, super super excited about absolutely because we realized that uh, and certainly through doing the 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 mastermind group um, for the seven levers, we realized that whatever we say, if, if we just send this information out, it becomes up to you to look at it from your business point of view, apply it, pick out the things that are relevant, go away and do it. Uh, and we don't want to leave people hanging. This is a community. This is the preneur community. And we, we want to be a part and join in with that community and help. So we're, we're putting something in place to make sure that we can do that. Let's, uh, let's leave it to that, shall we, Pete? Yep, so sevenlevers.com if you want to pre-register. Uh, just a little bit of an email list so we can uh, tell you guys first and not bombard everybody else uh, with pointless uh, and irrelevant marketing material. It's all about message to market match as we, you know, we're, we're doing what we preach. So uh, sevenlevers.com, put your email address in there and we'll let you know when all that's ready. It's, it's very, very close. That's it. Okay, folks. Um, that's it for this week. Thank you all for listening. Uh, as always, love your feedback. Thanks, everybody, that, again, that filled out the survey results over on preneurmarketing.com. Uh, there'll be a link to those in the show notes. Do go and have a look. It's very interesting reading. Um, but on top of the specific surveys that we've sent out, please do carry on with the feedback, um, whether it's on preneurmedia.tv using the really cool speak pipe service. Uh, you had some great messages on that. Uh, you just click on a button and you can record an audio message which is great, or in the comments or wherever, you can email us at support at preneurgroup.com and you can leave us a, a comment on iTunes in your particular country. Any of those things would be appreciated. We really like to hear back from you folks, see how we're doing. Well, keep us honest, hey? Um, so with that, see you next week, folks. Thanks, guys. <laughs> been enjoying another fine episode of PrinterCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gosher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at printermedia.tv or drop them a line via PrinterCast at printergroup.com.